on this episode of Designer Notes, we're going to try and make sense as to why you should get the Quartz PRX instead of the automatic version. We're also going to try and find some reasoning behind the Invicta Deep Sea Challenge. And finally, in our viewer comments, you found something else on my fingers. So I bought the Quartz PRX so that you don't have to. Because quite frankly, all of your friends may have been suggesting you to get the automatic version instead. And I wouldn't blame them because those configurations are quite nice looking and that waffle dial is simply stunning to many of you. However, I do have my reasons why the Quartz PRX may be better for most people, like me. Let's first remember that it was the Quartz PRX that launched the hype for this collection. This 40mm watch has the modern desirable diameter while sporting a thin 10mm thickness. It's water resistant up to 100 meters, protecting the EDA F06.115 Swiss quartz movement. This caliber keeps the case slim that pairs very well with smaller wrist size like mine. This is the main reason I chose the quartz model. It's a decision I could only make when I held the watch on hand. No matter what lighting situation it is, it delivers the same effect as a Royal Oak bracelet. Awesome feature of this piece is its quick change strap mechanism. This $60 option is very well worth the price as you're getting a premium grade strap from Tiso. Special thanks to Toyota Mo for helping me secure this strap. Once installed on the PRX, it exudes a certain poise that steel bands lack and it completely changes the impression. It manages to keep the same taper as the bracelet, but now providing the maximum fit for your wrist. This is a very dark blue version despite what my phone camera lens may show. The leather texture is very well pronounced and that male end lick properly blends the strap and case together. There was a slight delay from Tissot in releasing these leather strap options. The lugs took advantage of this by producing dedicated PRX straps themselves. I still found the ones from Tissot are more desirable because of that metal connector. The Lux offers more color varieties though and I'm sure to get one in the future. There are some flaws to this mechanism as it's rather hard to access the levers with my already long and disgusting fingernails. I can imagine this would be even harder for wider sausage digits. This is because of the angle of the straps against the edge of the case back. You might still want a precision screwdriver handy for strap changing. The PRX has become a phenomenon at this point, so here it is beside a fellow phenom, the Moon Swatch. The case size is identical and even the price is very close at this point. That's where the similarities end though as the PRX may have more wearable possibilities against the Moon Swatch. Beside another legendary watch, the original Rolex Mariner, the stylish elegance of the PRX stands out. I'm comparing two different types of watches here, but it's good to note how close their size profiles are. The automatic version of the PRX is a lot closer to the sub's thickness. The lack of an automatic rotor and general thinness of the Quartz EDA shapes microns off from this case. Let's now examine the smaller details of this Tissot. Tissot is indeed one of the top entry-level Swiss watch brands, and with all of the refined facets and pleasing textures on the case, the reason for making the PRX so popular becomes apparent. The case line under the bezel and above the case back cleverly extends to the rather thin and narrow bracelet links. As each link moves, the reflections of light on the brush facets beautifully dances over the bracelet. The links have a polished inner chamfer that creates striking contrast between the links. These enhance the sharp reflections. Of course, the narrower the links, the more it will conform to the unique shape of your wrist. This is my reason for buying a PRX, this very well-made bracelet that also happens to have high tolerances. The clasp is also well-constructed and polished for good measure. Once closed, the Tiso branding and established year unites to secure your PRX. There's nothing to see on the case back aside from the usual materials used and labels. I wouldn't have it any other way because it's an undecorated quartz caliber inside. On the top side though, you can enjoy the clear sapphire crystal and the wonderful polished chamfers and bezel. This is consistent to the rest of the watch, a hallmark of refinement. These same principles are applied to the optional strap. 
This is not your typical leather strap as Tiso had to design this specifically for the PRX. The angle of which this is connected to sits flush to the case and treads the same line from the lugs. Every PRX owner should at least have a pair of these leather straps. The textures of the exterior leather is just gorgeous and the lining underneath is appropriately soft. The hype is real. This really is a well-designed watch from every angle perceivable and we haven't even talked about the dial yet. That sunburst finish over the dark blue hue gives everything a nice platform to shine. It's as simple as can be with minimal text possible. Even the indexes are cut at an angle in keeping with the angular design of the exterior. This too is a light show to enjoy. Until when there's literal absence of light of course as the loom on these are mere lines on the indexes and hands. But that's okay, I didn't buy this to have a torch on my wrist. My Seiko Paddy Tuna may be bullying this PRX for its mediocre loom but I rarely take any of my divers to a night out with my significant other, unlike this PRX. Long after the launch of this collection, I already convinced myself that I'm buying this watch for the bracelet. I just need to choose between the automatic or quartz models. With the perfect dimensions for my wrist, I was surprised to find out something about myself, that I could abandon my preference for automatic watches. Because this thing can look like an affordable Bacheron Constantin overseas on the leather strap, or the alternate universe version of the AP Royal Oak with a quick switch of the bracelet, all accessible to the greater buying public. But all that is just an exaggerated justification of my watch purchase really, because on its own merit, the Tissot PRX needs no justification at all. You just need to find one that fits your fancy. In such a short while, the Tissot PRX became the quintessential integrated bracelet watch in the sub $1,000 category. Now, the quartz version is definitely not for everyone, but for wrists like mine, this is the perfect size and profile. Speaking of sizes, in a span of two days, two of the most popular watch brands release some collections that shows the uniqueness and quite frankly, the vainness of this uh, hobby of watch collecting. Now, if there was ever a line to be crossed towards absurdity, Rolex and Omega overshot that line by over 10,999 meters. However, this begs the question, why are we even okay with such an absurdity? The definition of impractical is not adapted for use or action, not sensible or realistic. As the images of the deep sea challenge on the wrist of watch fans flood the net the weekend after its release, it seemed pretty clear that the size can be called many things but sensible. But in order for us to determine what is not sensible, we must first determine what is sensible. There is no ideal wrist size to match the particular watch diameter. While there is an institution that's recognized worldwide for setting the standard for dive certification such as the ISO, there's no such thing for wrist sizes. A couple of decades back, 36 and 38 millimeters are still rather acceptable. Today, 36 is hardly a consideration. With size preference being relatively fluid, depending on the generation wearing it, there is a possibility out there that 50 millimeters will one day be acceptable. Dare we say even sensible. While the owners of the Deep Sea Challenge long for the expanding of their wrist size than their waistline, that is not the only thing to consider. What situations would make this watch more useful than, say, its grandfather, the Submariner? According to the Professional Association of Diving Instructors, anything from 18 to 30 meters, or 60 to 100 feet, is considered a deep dive in the context of recreational diving. This is the likeliest a person would be diving with a mechanical watch on and the Submariner is competent enough for this activity, 10 times over. In fact, you don't need a Submariner for this, since a G-Shock can also substitute in its place without sacrificing thousands of dollars and treads of sanity lost in the waitlist. All of this just makes the Deep Sea Challenge impractical despite its seeming ability to withstand unfathomable pressures. Impracticality also extends within the realms of ingenuity. Omega takes a jab at this with its recent mind-blowing product, the Speedmaster Chrono Chime. 
The mechanical chronograph has long been made obsolete by electronic technology with the rise of the very accurate and low-cost quartz timers. In an ironic twist of horological faith, the very thing that created the mechanical chrono, ingenuity fueled the creation of digital devices. Although rendered as not needed, these chronographs continue to exist as the watch industry pivots into two distinct segments. It's fascinating to observe as one pursues accuracy and practicality while the other chased artistry and prestige, both in the name of human ingenuity. Down this path, chronographs can be cased in precious metals such as gold when steel should suffice or titanium could be desired for durability. It's not a question of practicality anymore. Now it's a statement of what can be done beautifully. This is how we got the chrono chime. This is what Omega says about the chrono chime. Omega's coaxial master chronometer, caliber 1932, is the world's first and the most complicated movement the brand has ever launched. A fully integrated chronograph and minute repeater destined to rewrite the watchmaking rulebook. Not a reinvention or a modification, completely new. A movement made by hand able to chime elapsed times thanks to a mechanical brain which merges its functions and senses which to engage. In essence, they are saying, we are the first to do this, it's very hard to make, and it's for the sake of watchmaking. We shouldn't even think about timing a bus or how many evenly cooked eggs you can time with this watch. Of course, Omega won't stop you from using this corn chime for such menial tasks, but it's preferred that you wait to chime this masterpiece until that dinner with those three CEOs that you know, all wearing those paddocks and APs. Rolex and Omega, like many other watch brands that operate in the realm of luxury watchmaking, they deliberately ignore what's practical and affordable because, well, it's the opposite of luxury. It's just good business and common sense. But when you add another layer of impracticality to the already impractical product, it turns all of us into sensitive horological activists ready to rain fire and sulfur over these brands. But this too is deliberate. Because in the world of watchmaking, positioning a product for maximum exposure is key. The Chrono Chime is the first. It's unheard of. It's only for the elite. It's planting the flag on the moon before the Russians do. It will be remembered long after the units have been sold. Or so at least what Omega thinks that it would do. Back to Rolex, why release the Deep Sea Challenge now? Why not back in Watches and Wonders? likely because enough time has passed after the release of its rival, the Ultra Deep. Or even more likely, it's because James Cameron is releasing his much-anticipated second Avatar movie. Cameron's cachet in pop culture is unparalleled, and riding this wave of publicity will only be good for Rolex. While many have achieved a death rating greater than the Deep Sea Challenge, none were endorsed by a man that's been under the Mariana Trench with the watch's prototype. These two brands used impracticality as a statement because if it was simply practical, then it's just like any other Submariner or Speedmaster out there. These are glorified trophies that can happen to tell the time. One is brute force record breaking while the other is a technical cerebral shatter, both useless and will be sold out. Even if most of us won't even see these watches in our lifetime, we will accept them as pieces of horology. It will not prevent us from throwing the first stones of criticism because these stones will be part of watchmaking history. Milestones in watchmaking regardless of impracticality. So why listen to your watch tell the time when you can spend the same amount of money to buy a new set of eyeballs? Or better yet, why buy a watch that can dive to 11,000 meters when you still need to spend millions to buy a submersible to strap that said watch onto? Well, because these watches are meant to be collected first and then used later. It's all part of the blueprint of impracticality. And quite frankly, we collectors and enthusiasts allow such things. Now it's time for your viewer comments.
we're going to read a few more of the comments from our latest Rolex Deep Sea Challenge uh, video. Emo Gerber says, it is a fail. Or he simply put, fail. Well, he is true in some sense. That Mexican guy who funnily has uh, Michael Pena's uh, profile here, I would try to read this while imagining it's uh, Michael Pena that's uh, saying this. Still second best. Haha. <laughs> the Omega Ultra Deep is a smaller version than another watch they created. They made it smaller and wearable and reduced the water resistance to 6,000 meters. But Rolex don't care about wearability and just want people to think that they're the best. Many truths with, uh, with that and actually that act that makes the Rolex uh, Deep Sea Challenge uh, fail according to uh, what our previous uh, viewer said because you couldn't even wear the darn thing. Of course, Omega's Ultra Deep is not as wearable as most watches are but comparison to the Deep Sea Challenge it is quite wearable compared to that. MJ says original gas escape valve and ring lock system looks a bit tacky. It is. Perhaps even unnecessary. I would rather prefer a blank lock ring system or system ring or even colored one. What if the lock system ring was made out of an exotic material or maybe even meteorite? Other than that, it's a pretty sweet watch. Okay, so MJ seems to at the very least be positive about the deep sea challenge. However, I don't like his take with the ring lock system. I would rather actually have it like how Rolex has it now to preserve that monochromatic look of the watch. After all, it does look like a sea dweller, which is in turn like the Submariner, which is just steel, black, and monochromatic. And quite frankly, in any other material, it doesn't make sense either anyway. Thomas De Nielsen said, De Nielsen or Danielson? Thomas Danielson. Okay. 50 mm? 23 mm? Idiot. I don't know who he's calling an idiot here, if it's Rolex or me, but okay, I'll take that as a comment. Fries with Mayo says, both unwearable and stupid as no human being is water or pressure resistant at either 6,000 meters or 11,000 meters. Next. Well, unless if your neighbor is a mariner, then maybe you could withstand all of such pressures. Then you can buy a deep sea challenge as your um, Rolex Grail watch to wear in Atlantis. Anyway, he says here next is uh, Fries and Mayo actually looking for the next absurd watch or just simply looking at another watch for his uh, newsfeed. Uh, let uh, Fries and Mayo take that. Gordon Johnston said, I was wondering why Omega doesn't have a helium escape valve. Now, the Ultra Deep didn't have that uh, helium escape valve because no helium is actually entering that case either way. They created or they designed that case in titanium and using liquid metal to uh, ensure that it has a much better water resistance to the point that helium itself couldn't even enter it. So, it doesn't need any helium escape valve. Now, what I would like to see is for them to use this same kind of technology in their uh, diving professional watches such as the regular Seamaster. I don't know how that's going to be financially impacted by that uh, technology, but if they could do it with the Ultra Deep, I don't see why they couldn't do it with the Seamaster. Quicker Than Drawing says, this was always coming as the prototype was unveiled a decade ago. He is right, and I failed to mention that in my review. Actually, there is a 52 or rather 54 millimeter um, prototype that James Cameron dove with in the Marianas Trench, Mariana Trench, and that was made in steel, which is absurdly heavy, and 54 uh, millimeters is just simply way way too big uh, even even compared to this 50 millimeter uh, version of the deep sea challenge 135i pocket rocket says i'd say the h2 kalmar is a much better depth statement option rated at 25,000 meters and less than 2500 dollars so 
less than a tenth of the price with more than double the water resistance. Also is grade 5 titanium, although only in ETA2892 inside. A decent alternative for the budget-minded crowd perhaps. If you really are budget-minded first, then this really is a much better option. However, I'm not so keen about this Calmar H2O CalMarts design. I, I honestly quite uh, view it as quite ugly, but I guess they designed that as a statement like what um, 135 here uh, said that they could actually make this water resistant to 25,000 meters. Andrea actually follow up um, Pocket Rocket's comment. Nice one. I have a Kinzel, the deepest, and it goes to 12,000 meters, which is 1,000 meters over the deep sea challenge, and I paid just 200 euros about it uh, for it. Haha. <laughs> But I love this Rolex. The technology and the history is unique. Unfortunately, not very wearable at 50 millimeters. So Andrea here actually appreciates the history and what Rolex is trying to posture here with their virtue. And to many people, that's the same sentiment. William Stalvey writes, Love how all these so-called experts are trashing the 50 millimeter Rolex, yet they are all trying to be the best uh, they're best to secure one and then flip. Great tough watch. Okay, not all experts are trying to get one because quite frankly, many of the experts are just commenting on it. But nevertheless, it is true that some are trying to get this to uh, be a safe queen because quite frankly, that's the only way that it's going to fit anywhere. To flip it afterwards is just really the common market um, practice nowadays, especially when it comes to Rolex sports watches. So I understand uh, what he's saying here. But I think what he's pointing out is the hypocrisy between um, watch journalism and securing these pieces for its market value. I'll leave that up to all of the people. I cannot, we, none of us actually, quite frankly, can judge whatever uh, a person is uh, doing or feeling about this watch or about the uh, flipping of watches. It's up to them personally and quite frankly if they don't say anything then there's no way for us to find out. Gene Key says in Morse code dot dash dot is the letter R. Now what he's saying here is the crown uh, symbol for titanium which is dot dash dot uh, by Rolex. It's pretty well known to Rolex enthusiasts that that crown symbol signifies the material used for the specific timepiece. And here it's that uh, dot dash dot which signifies Rolex. So if Rolex deliberately did this, well done Rolex. Paprice P says, apparently they work with Comex to make a pressure tank strong enough to test this watch to 25% deeper than 11,000 meters. The R&D cost must have been a lot and how they would have partially justified the price. Well, Rolex can justify their price any which way they want. They, they don't have to like rely on R&D or cover up the, the cost for R&D to get their profits up. And quite frankly, uh, everything else or the market follows the pricing of Rolex. But nevertheless, uh, the pricing has been going down as we've seen uh, in recent auctions and in recent um, market uh, movements. So maybe there's uh, some change coming down the road. And I'm also going to make a video about that. I recently experienced something about that that deserves a whole video on itself. But going back to the comics, um, uh, comment by Paprice. The, it is true, Comex developed this uh, machine to test this 11,000 meters of water resistance for this uh, deep sea challenge. So that also now begs the question to the, the uh, uh, that, that actually harkens back to the question that we had earlier about that other watch that was tested for 25,000 meters. How did they test that if Comex had to do this? And now for our final comment. Kenny Go says, I instantly stopped watching when I saw your fingernails dirty. Let me just, yeah, there you go. Okay. Now, when I was like re reading this comment, I, I was curious and checked out uh, and searched out the comments if there was any other, uh, anything about nails in my 
in my comments and lo and behold I actually found another comment regarding this about a year ago and it says there by Carla Adriana Valero your nails are longer than me probably she's saying longer than mine because there's probably no 10 millimeter uh, tall uh, women out there nevertheless your nails are longer than mine and I am a woman it is horrible to see when men's hands with long ones it's disgusting it is good that your wrist is as thin as mine and your hands are even more feminine but I hear a man's voice behind that little ones and feminine little hands and another thing there's another talking and then swallowing while talking and then sounds very big I don't know what she meant by that or maybe piggish or eat and talk dude you need education okay first and foremost I'd like to say I'm sorry and I apologize for having smaller wrists and feminine at that. I'm sorry about that if you expect more about your reviewer. But I do thank you for calling me having a manly voice. That I do appreciate. Now let's point out a few things here. Now it's only good and proper to have uh, clean hygiene all the time. You know? It's just good for your health, it's just more desirable, and it's just more uh, attractive in general. Even if you're wearing gloves underneath those hands just to make your tabletop videos more professional looking, it's not an excuse to have dirty nails underneath those gloves. In fact, there's a whole industry built around hand modeling, if you just look at the movie Zoolander and you understand what I mean. And second, I'm very proud of our watch community viewers because they are a discerning and eloquent and classy crowd. They do not settle for the mind-numbing short videos of people dancing to broken record tunes or the myriads of cat videos that only goes to show that human beings are far worse than cats even though we all know that cats are evil creatures. Watch viewers demand a little bit more than the passing mention of the specifications and the profile dimensions of a watch. That's what we are. That's what you are, watch viewers. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that you command a cadence from your reviewers. And as a reviewer myself, I endeavor to uphold all of these very high standards that you impose on me because quite frankly, you deserve it. You truly make this very small niche of ours far better than, say, uh, the failed video crowd. With that in mind, I arrive to my excuse. What Kenny Go saw, actually, is in fact a failed video that's elaborately staged to specifically test your tolerances towards the uncapped and derelict. You can see this with the aforementioned dirty nails the harsh lighting, the awkward upside-down bezel of the G-Shock, and not to mention that I shot all of this in a dirty, rusted garbage bin. But all of these failures are actually a test of your endurance. How long can you stay in focus on the watch while ignoring all of the deplorable stuff that's happening in the background? You see, watch enthusiasts are like Iron Man. No, not the billionaire playboy philanthropist kind, but rather the athlete. The athlete that subjects himself to all sorts of punishment, all the while looking at this ever so interesting timepiece at hand. You see, I hold you all to such high standards. When I make these videos, I make them knowing that you watch every moment of it down to the last second. Even though YouTube constantly lies to me saying that you jump off at the first two minutes and continue to watch more Rolex updates and cat videos. I know you are gentlemen and ladies out there that watch my videos very very closely and I truly appreciate your support. You deserve the best. You deserve a theatrical production and I was simply keeping in character. But ultimately the simplest excuse of them all is that I'm your local unlettered horological pirate from the literal Caribbean. Finally, some words of wisdom from Mr. Zilos. Someone finally made a watch thicker than a Zilos Abyss 3, which is 20.5 millimeters. 23 millimeters! Holy crap! Gorgeous though. 
but not enough for me to abandon the deep sea James Cameron. But as an engineering tour de force, good job Rolex. With my wrist, I'd wear the hell out of it, no matter what Freddy says. Thank you so much, Mr. Zillas, and enjoy diving with that James Cameron. And we'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much. The Tiso PRX has become the quintessential stillness. <laughs> you see, all watch enthusiasts are like iron men. No, not the billiber, the billiber, 